Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Tennessee, and Virginia. Listen up. Win Bet is now live in all these states, and the excitement of Win Las Vegas has finally landed in online sports betting and casino play. From boosted parlays to live in game offs on every major sport, Win Bet gives you the tools to win. Sign up today for your risk free $1,000 sports bet. Download the Win Bet app now or visit wynnbet.com to start winning. You are listening to Dove Valley Deep Divers with Eric Trickle and Lance Sanderson. Ball comes out of the hands of Newton. It's on the ground, picked up by T.J. Ward at the four-yard line. Vaughn Miller did it again. On Overtime Media. We are good. Mile high. Hello, everybody. Welcome into the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. And I am your host, Lance Sanderson. As jo- and, and joining me, as per usual, is my good colleague and uh, great friend, uh, Mile High Huddle Senior NFL Draft Analyst, the one and only Eric Trickle. Eric, it's been obviously a f- like fire sale of news for the Broncos. I, I mean, we're talking about um, Vic Vangel getting fired earlier this week. Um, top 10 draft pick again for the second straight year in a row. A uh, lot of news coming down the pike. Uh, obviously the ownership situation is in flux right now uh, the, because the judge just determined that Edgar Kaiser doesn't have uh, any right of first refusal claims at all anymore. So looks like a, a sale for the team is coming down the pike. Dude, how are you holding up right now with all the news that's going on? Man, I've just been kind of numb to the news. I'm just preparing to hit 30 tomorrow. Um, <laughs> that's right. But no, I mean, there's obviously all these concerns about the ownership situation. We'll find out more about that after they hired the new coach, which was always the plan. Like yeah. even if they got news earlier, they were going to hire a new coach beforehand. And I know that's going to rub a lot of people wrong, the wrong way and everything, but uh, that's just how their plans been. Um, we got a little bit of uh, word about who the, some of the ownership groups with John Elway being part of one. And I think Peyton Manning teaming up with the owner of fanatics. Yeah. Uh, uh, Michael Rubin, Michael Rubin is his name. Yes. Which, I mean, if those are the two final choices, I hope it's not John Elway. I mean, I just have this fear that he's going to end up like that Dan Snyder, Jerry Jones, Al Davis type. That's very involved and what's going on, and after the last few years of John Elway, it didn't turn out so well. Listen up, Broncos country. Tick Pick should be your first choice to buy football tickets because they save fans money by never charging any service fees ever. Tick Pick is the exclusive ticketing partner for the Huddle Up podcast and the Blue Wire Network. Denver Broncos football is finally back, and there's no need to exhaust yourself searching all over the internet to find Broncos tickets anymore because Tick Pick, that's T I C K. P-I-C-K is the original no-fee ticket site and the only one you'll ever need as your go-to for all NFL tickets. TickPick got rid of all those awful service fees that the other ticket sites charge, which lets them guarantee the best prices on all of their NFL tickets. Don't believe it? If you can find better prices for the same seats on another ticket site, TickPick will give you 110% of the difference in the purchase price. That's right, guys. When we were searching for tickets for the MHH meet and greet for week three at home, Broncos versus Jets, Tick Pick had us locked down. So visit tickpick.com slash huddle today and use the promo code huddle to save $10 on your first order of Broncos tickets. I mean, as you said, I mean, there's just so much news and we're trying to sift through it all. And it's been a, a little overwhelming. I mean, the head coach is fired. And then not long afterwards, we get all these stuff about all these coaching candidates and 10, play, 10 coaches being interviewed for it. And then the ownership stuff. And so on and so forth. Graham Glasgow and ended up restructured, which I think was a little bit of news that kind of went under the radar. Yep. Um, which was great to see because it gives them plenty of options for it. So it's it's going to be a fun show as we try to cover a little bit of all of this and but specifically focus on the coaching news. Yeah, it's it's like I said, it's been uh, like a whirlwind of news. I mean, and something that really did slide underneath the radar is the Graham Glasgow restructure, dropping him from I think it's eight point four million dollars next year down to three point one. He can get another one point four in incentives for I believe it's like playing ninety percent of the snaps or something like that. For base salary. Hungry. Yep, for his base salary. But uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's it's been kind of crazy. And honestly, to me, I like the Graham Glasgow signing to the, the, to get him back under under contract under a, a, a much better number for this next season. And also it might tap into the versatility a little bit. You and Carl were talking in our group chat the other day about 
what the direction of this offensive line might look like. And Lloyd Cushenberry might need to take note of what's going on with Graham Glasgow here because Glasgow at his best year in Detroit was playing center. He was better at center at Michigan as well. So it, it is a very notable move here to drop his salary down, get him on the bottom level of the center contracts, and uh, maybe see what Quinn Miners has and let uh, Natani Moody and uh, Dalton Reisner battle it out for the left guard position. Now, Eric, uh, what would you think about that? If, the, if that was the direction the Broncos went in, what was what would you be your original thoughts on that? I mean, it's hard to speculate about the interior offensive line at the moment because we just don't know what scheme they're going to. Right. Um, because Lloyd Cushenberry, Dalton Reisner, they spit, they fit one specific scene or scheme. Graham Glasgow has a little bit more scheme versatility. Quinn Miners really shines in one specific scheme, but maybe he can develop that movement skills to be versatile enough to fit a more outside zone scheme based uh, or more outside zone scheme. So it's really tough without knowing what we're going to be going into with how they performed this last year, where we got to see a lot of everything from them. I think the best interior honestly might be Dalton Reisner and Natani Moody fighting it out for one guard spot. And even you could even throw Lloyd Cushenberry there. I don't think he can handle it at guard, but you can at least let him compete for it with Graham Glasgow at center and then Quinn Miners at the other guard spot. Yeah, I, I mean that makes that makes sense as well. And Quinn Miners has been playing just fantastically, and one of the top what four players on the offense, like as a whole over the season. As a rookie, it's crazy. He's just he's been very very good, and I, I'm glad that we got to the chance to scout him uh, as far as coming through the Senior Bowl and stuff like that. You and I had multiple conversations about him behind the scenes, and uh, I wrote up the scouting report for him. And to see him actually pan out the way that he has coming out of Wisconsin, Whitewater has been just amazing and he's exceeded pretty much every expectation for what you would expect from a d3 player coming into the nfl um and also taking a year off of football switching to a new position for him as well uh, learning two positions on the fly like quinn miners is a is a player and he's going to be a a long-term piece for this franchise now guys before we get going on this we're talking about the offensive coordinator defensive coordinator positions that could potentially be hired behind the top three new head coaching prospects that the the broncos are currently looking at in dan quinn kellen moore and nathaniel hack it now with that said guys uh obviously eric um you have a, a great article up at uh, milehighhuddle.com talking about how this coaching search could potentially be flawed because it's very apparent and it has been for a while now that the uh, the front runner for this do this denver broncos head coach position has been the uh, defensive coordinator for the dallas cowboys in dan quinn and this is a guy that i jumped quickly on board and said that this is a, a guy that i really like i'm intrigued by him um I, I looked. I liked what he did in in Atlanta. There in his stint there, they obviously went to the Super Bowl. Whether you uh, dislike the way that that all played out, um, obviously leading twenty eight to three, going late into the third quarter, um, they they ended up blowing it, blew the the game in overtime. Whatever you may have, and that does fall on the head coach's uh, shoulders there for not getting into his offensive coordinator's ear and saying, "Hey, let's run the ball, run the clock here." Um, regardless, though, the, his his teams were always prepared. They always came out fiery. They always came out um, with a lot of emotion, a lot of passion. Um, they they played hard for Dan Quinn, and they went to bat for him several times, especially later towards the end of his tenure there. And, and in fact, Matt Ryan actually went directly to Arthur Blank and said, "Hey, you need to keep Dan Quinn around for another year because we, we've let him down. Us." His players have let him down. Now, to me, his connection with George Payton, uh, he wanted to work with George Payton in Atlanta. Obviously, that makes it easy to see the front runner. Now, is Dan Quinn the first name that pops in your mind when you think about the Broncos head coaching position, or is there another guy? I mean, I think it's Dan, basically Dan Quinn's job to lose, which that's where that whole article come from or spawned from of potentially this being a flawed system or a flawed hiring process, I mean, which isn't exactly – my belief just to be clear out there this article it came after i spoke to multiple different bronco fans it was like over 20 total of them that i spoke to about it and their their beliefs i mean i believe that they're valid it seems very much that they're dead set on dan quinn and that the interviews for some of these other candidates are more so for offensive coordinator defensive coordinator positions or just info gathering without serious shots for the head coaching position and I've always felt, and we see this time and time again, teams go into it, they have one or two guys in mind, and they throw out a bunch of other interviews just for different reasons. And it's always, I've always viewed that as a flawed process. Now, can't say for sure that it is flawed, um, because we just don't know what's going on in George Payton's head. We're not there in the interviews. Maybe these guys do actually have a chance for um, 
getting the head coaching job and they just don't impress enough in the interview or, and Dan Quinn goes out there and absolutely kills it. And I like Dan Quinn as a head coach possibility. He's not my top guy, but he's not my bottom guy of the 10 that they interviewed. He's probably right there around three, four, maybe five, even um, just in the, in the top half. So I like it, but there's definitely, you can look at this, look at how they're going about it. The fact that he's the only coach with coaching experience. And especially if they hire Dan Quinn and they tout that as the reason why, really points to the fact that this was a yeah. flawed process. Like, yep. I hope it isn't. We saw this happen with uh, John Elway multiple times. They went in after Gary Kubiak stepped down with Vance Joseph in mind, and that's who they went with, especially after Joe Ellis reportedly nixed Kyle Shanahan. They went in, but on the counterpoint of this, they went into the process where they walked with Mr. Fangio with Mike Munchak as the guy, and the interviews mattered. So hard to say without being part of the interviews, but there's definitely reasons to believe that it is. I like Dan Quinn. I don't love him. Uh, my top guy is actually Nathaniel Hackett. I like what he did with that Jaguars offense. Yeah. He really had a lot of control over, not um, Doug Marone. Um, and he got the best years out of Blake Bortles' career. And people don't realize, as great as that defense was, that offense was good enough. It was efficient. And they were able, they were boasted a top 10 offense in EPA in overall passing and rushing offense as well as success rates so well it obviously helps when you have leonard fournette and that offensive line that was just grinding open running lanes for him and fournette was on a tear uh bortles was playing better with the play action game which is something that i think actually translates especially if the broncos don't get a premier quarterback and they want to run with drew locks like drew lock works way better out of play action they have javante williams coming back obviously on his rookie contract they have a great running game great offensive line play that they can work with up front and obviously a bunch of better weapons. I mean, did they still have Allen Robinson back then? I think they might have had Allen Robinson still, but I think that uh, that was pretty so. much, I think that was pretty much the only weapon that they have. Cause that was after, um, that was after Julius Thomas had flamed out of the NFL. So it, it's, it's just crazy to me. The Nathaniel Hackett hasn't really gotten as much run in, in the consideration here. And I think honestly, he might be looking at, an, at another gig. I would love to get him here. Um, I just want some more stability, someone that has a little bit more experience at the head coaching position, a guy that, uh, you know, has been there, done that, been to the big moments. Uh, Nathaniel Hackett's been there as an offensive coordinator, obviously going to that AFC championship game, and taking dragging Blake Bortles there. But uh, yeah, Dan Quinn's my top guy and Nathaniel Hackett's the, the second guy. Uh, Travis Weber jumping in here. Good evening, Lance and Eric in Broncos country. Uh, we have talked head coaches. I'd be okay with Quinn, but would rather have an offensive minded coach since the last two have been defensive. As to the coordinators, who is available? And I'm glad that you are here, Travis, because we have a great list for you and we're going to break it down for you. I've got some names for each one of these candidates. And since we're talking about Dan Quinn right now off the top of my head, um, the, the offensive coordinator candidates are actually pretty intriguing. One of them, the Broncos actually interviewed, I believe, today. I think that they actually switched the one. It was uh, Luke Getze, who is the quarterback's coach and offensive coordinator for the uh, Green Bay Packers. Uh, they interviewed him for the head coaching position. However, I don't necessarily think that that's truly the case. I think that they were just trying to get some information from him and see what his direction for this offense would be. With Dan Quinn... As the head coach, you get a young first-time offensive coordinator, and Dan has done a really good job of identifying at least quality quality coordinators, maybe not Dirk Cutter, but Steve Sarkeesian, Kyle Shanahan, um, getting these young guys in there, letting them run the offense. Uh, Dan just kind of oversees the operation, and Getsy is a very intriguing option to me. The other one that intrigues me as well, and uh, Eric, you might have some more information on him, uh, is Mike McDaniel, who is the offensive coordinator, I believe was the quarterback's coach there for a little bit, in San Francisco under Mike or uh, Kyle Shanahan. Excuse me. Uh, those are my two preferred options with Dan Quinn because you have um, – you have a couple of guys that uh, are underneath the uh, um, the Shanahan coaching tree. I believe Getsy was under the Shanahan coaching tree as well there for a little bit. Um, but then obviously Mike McDaniel, who is Kyle Shanahan's right-hand man. Those are the two names that jump off the screen to me. Yeah, I really like Mike McDaniel. I like Luke Getsy as well. And just you had a little error there. He's the off quarterback's coach and passing game coordinator. Okay. I said offensive coordinator. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really like Mike McDaniel. I wanted him over Rick Scangarello. And yeah. A couple years ago, and that just didn't happen. We got stuck with Rick Sangarello, who has got to be the most overrated offensive coordinator to get fired after a year. I mean, like, he wasn't good, and a lot of Bronco fans want to hold on hope to him, but it, it wasn't a good time that year for him. The offense was wildly inefficient and just so many issues. 
Mike McDaniel, I think he can come in and being that right hand man to Kyle Shanahan, I think he offers a lot more. Um, there's some concerns out there about his past and stuff like that, but yeah, it's too, it's not big enough to be super concerned about. Not a big enough issue of, you know, some uh, other people out there not beating his wife or anything like that. It's just been some, <laughs> some uh, what's the right word? Narcotic abuse, I guess would be the best way to put it. Uh. Um, so, I mean, I would really like him. And he's been the guy who's been linked with Dan Quinn coming as the head coach with Mike McDaniel following up. The issue I have is I'm not sure how Denver gets him without San Francisco blocking him because he is eligible to be blocked as far as I'm aware. Um, play calling, it's not a promotion to tack on play calling and it's not considered a promotion to tack on assistant head coach either to the NFL because to the NFL, assistant head coach is just a made-up title. Um, when they made these changes to promotions and stuff like that back in May 2020, that was actually a comment made by a spokesperson for the NFL um, so I'm not sure how they get it. The easiest way is that for the offense coordinator to be eligible to be blocked is that they have to run their sides of the ball. They have to run the team meetings for it. Now, Kyle Shanahan there's, wouldn't surprise me at all if he's the one that's running the offensive side team meetings and not Mike McDaniel. So that would that would be the way. You give him that, you give him full responsibility over the offense, and that right there would be considered a promotion. And one thing on this is with the whole thing of promotions that's a little – iffy with me is that they haven't fully highlighted exactly what qualifies it for as a promotion. It's just that if teams want to interview somebody, they have to give exactly what they're interviewing for, exactly what their position would be, everything like that to Roger Goodell, and Roger Goodell gets to decide if it's a promotion or not. Yeah, so, it's, it's very iffy. Luke Getze, that would be a very obvious promotion. He shares titles of the with the passing game coordinator. That's a shared title. As long as he's getting offensive coordinator, that would be a very clear promotion, so there wouldn't be any issues there trying to get him in. Right, and his true title is actually quarterbacks coach. I know they, they have him as a passing game coordinator as well, but the uh, what is what is his name? I actually have it right here because we're going to talk about him in a minute. Uh, um, where is it at? Give me a second, guys. It's Adam, uh, Stenovich. Adam, Adam Stenovich. That's the name. That's the running game coordinator for the uh, – he's uh, the running backs coach and running game coordinator for the Green Bay Packers as well. Uh, we'll get to him more here in just a second. But before we go to the defensive side of the football, as far as defensive coordinators, I want to uh, say hello to everybody in the chat. Uh, we have Peter dropping some stars here in just uh, just a couple minutes ago. And I want to make sure that we give him the shout out that he deserves joining us all the way over in Cambodia, like he does every single Friday. Uh, we've got Nelson in the house, uh, Todd Osendorf as well. Uh, Terry Martin, uh, Greg Smith jumping in here saying hello to Michael Ronquillo, who shows love to every single show. Uh, Peter jumping in. I want to just grab this really fast because Eric also has another article up on milehighhuddle.com about kind of the timeline of what we're looking at here. So Peter asks, how long do you think this process will take? Are we going to find a new head coach before the Super Bowl? Eric, what do you think? Well, I mean, the interview process just for the first wave of interviews will be ending sometime next week because mm -hmm. there's so many candidates. They've only been able to interview three of their 10 this week because all the rest are in the playoffs and they have to play this weekend. Uh, Eric, so... so you uh, get Quick question. Has anybody, has any of the 10 candidates turned down the, re the request? I have not seen any news on that. I haven't seen anybody turn down the request yet. Okay. Um, so that's seven interviews have to do next week. That'll be the first bout of it. Then they'll probably have a second where well, they'll probably cut down the field by, I'd say at least 50%, get down to their final three, four, maybe five candidates that they want to interview a second time and go into more in depth about their vision for the offense, their vision for their coaching staff around them. So, I mean, Super Bowl time, that's probably a decent decent timeline about gauging how long it'll take, maybe the week beforehand. But this was always going to be like a three, maybe four-week process to hire a new coach. Right. And another thing, uh, Jacob, jumping in here and dropping some stars really fast, want to just sh uh, show you some love since you're showing us some love, and we appreciate you for joining us. Uh, another thing that goes into this consideration is uh, where are the teams that – obviously Dan Quinn is on the Cowboys, Nathaniel Hackett's on the Green Bay Packers. When are they eliminated from playoff contention? Because they can't accept a job until after that's over. So if – let's say the Green Bay Packers go into the Super Bowl and – um, the Broncos want to hire Nathaniel Hackett as their head coach. They have to wait until the Super Bowl is over, essentially. Um, Dallas, I don't think they're going to make it that far, but same instance for them. I mean, if they make it to the NFC Championship game, they have to wait until Dan Quinn or Kellen Moore is potentially eliminated from playoff contention to finalize that hiring in, to begin with. So it, this could take a while. It really can. Um, 
I don't think that that's necessarily going to well, be the case because I do think that San Francisco is actually going to upset Dallas on, I believe it's Saturday. I think that's when they play is the, the afternoon game on Saturday. So I do think that Dan Quinn will become available and Kellen Moore uh, as early as Sunday to interview and then uh, be able to accept a job should that be the direction that the Broncos want to go. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that even if they make it to the Super Bowl, if you have your coach in mind and you have that unwritten, un right 100 percent agreement there the verbal agreement that they'll be the head coach you still can move forward with the process you can go forward hiring their coordinators if they're available you can go right. forward hiring other things and you can have your coaching staff or your scouting staff scouting department your nfl scouting department um you can have them going forward to identify targets that they want because you right. can start giving ideas to the players about what type of scheme you're going to be running and stuff like that you can go forward with it even if they're not officially hired because there's other stuff you can do so having to wait a little bit longer if they do, if say, say their idea plan, ideal plan is um, Eric Bynamy as the head coach and Luke Getzey as the offense coordinator, they can go forward with it, with that plan in mind. And I'm not, I don't think that's at all the plan there. I'm just, no, you know, they can go forward with that. If those two teams make it to the Super Bowl, they can go through with them in mind, with them in mind as their head coach and offense coordinator and prepare things for when they are done with the Super Bowl and they can actually hire them. Yeah. Speaking of uh, going with, going on with the scouting process and stuff like that. And that's a very astute point and something that you and I've had conversations about behind the scenes as well. Um, like well, it's, <laughs> it's a matter of opinion here and my opinion's valid. Yours might be the right one, but I also mine might, might be right. Uh, Travis jumping in here one more time. Uh, I'd be shocked if anyone does turn down an interview when Denver is set up to be a top landing spot. And quite honestly, they might be the top landing spot. Uh, I want to grab this question really fast. Uh, K Hop 16 jumping in here. How would uh, Ahmad Sauce Gardner look alongside Pat Sertan in a potential, let's call it Dan Quinn defense? That cover three scheme, they're using some more two man and stuff like that this year. But uh, Sauce Gardner and Pat Sertan, that seems pretty all right to me. I mean, I would like it being able to potentially get a great duo at corner for years to come on rookie deals for the next four years at least. Well, next four years for sure, not at least. Mm-hmm. Yep. With Pat Sertan with the fifth year option. I mean, that'd be great. That's a great idea. It's one reason why Andrew Booth Jr., Derek Stingley Jr., Sauce Gardner, it's exactly it's why that I'm not completely off the topic or off the idea of potentially taking them at nine if Denver keeps that pick. Like right. it's a great idea to potentially get that pair in there. I'm not sure about Sauce Gardner at nine and a trade back. Maybe you can get back into the teens and still be able to land him. I think um, another guy that I really like Darian Kendrick out of Georgia. I I know that he's got the off field issues and stuff like that, but that dude's a baller, man. He is so freaking good at the cornerback position can play the slot can play on the boundary as well. Big physical, nice tackler. Like that guy, if it weren't for him having the off field issues, I think that he would be a first round pick. And if you can get him in the second round, like that to me is an enticing idea. Uh, anyways, now we're going to move back on to the conversation at hand here. Defensive uh, – wait, uh, Peter jumping in here. Is there a defensive coordinator that you would prefer for the offensively orientated head coaches? I have a feeling we will keep ours uh, at Donatel. Is that a potential possibility? Um, I'm not sure about that one. Specifically to Dan Quinn, though, um, a guy that the Broncos are slated to interview is a linebacker's coach for the New England Patriots, Gerard Mayo. I would not hate that if the Broncos wanted to go in that kind of a direction, a little bit different in the schemes, but they do run a lot of the same concepts for uh, the New England Patriots as compared to the Broncos um, quarter stuff, match quarter stuff, a lot of two man. Um, they, they bring a lot more pressure up front and, and the, the specific designs that they use more than Vic Fangio would have. But uh, I, I like the idea there. Now, one that I want to bounce off you, Eric, and I was kind of thinking uh, hyperbolic here, um, but more of a just, things rattling around in my head, uh, the Raiders and their potential head coaching search uh, to go get uh, Jim Harbaugh. It's been widely rumored and speculated that if Jim Harbaugh was to be the head coach of the Raiders, that they would go and they would hire Vic Fangio to be the defensive coordinator there, which would then open up a crony of the one and only Dan Quinn and Gus Bradley. Would that be a pairing that you would be interested in? Is Dan Quinn with Gus Bradley as he's defensive coordinator, a guy that they work together in Seattle? Building the Legion of Boob defense? No. No? Why not? No. <laughs> no. Um, Dan Quinn Dan Quinn at least showed a little bit willingness to go away from the cover three. Gus right. Bradley has not. <laughs> that's fair. That's no. that's a fair point. No, and, and, no, definitely not. 
it was it, like I said, it was more of a connection thing, connecting the dots and seeing some some people, some names that we could uh, potentially um, yeah. be paired there. Uh, another thing well, that I had heard well, go ahead. going back to Ed Donatel, I mean, I don't mind, hate the idea of it. Ed Donatel, it's been a long time since he's called plays, though. Long yeah. time. Yeah. Um, so I have a little hesitancy there. I would like to go a little bit younger, and this this might get me some flack because the guy, I mean, he's only spent one year in Denver, but. If you want to go young and you want to get somebody who knows the system and kind of keep the system around, go Christian Parker. Yeah, I was. I mean, say there's that been name. nothing but praise for this. There's been a lot of talk coming out um, out of Denver through conversations that I've had with multiple people that the players they didn't want to play for Vic Fangio, but they kept playing for Christian Parker. Primarily, the people in the secondary. A couple of players elsewhere were playing for their position coaches. Reggie Herring had a lot of respect. Um, Pagano, um, John Pagano. Yeah, that they were playing for them more so than Vic Fangio, that he was keeping them going. But Christian Parker, I think that he's going to, before long, he'll be viewed as a young, bright mind. Nothing but rave reviews from him with how he handled players, with how he was able to um, help players come along. I mean, Pat Sertan was, I think Pat Sertan actually spoke about the how much Parker helped him along, especially he when he first came to Denver. Um, mm -hmm. Michael Ojemudia, um I, or Justin Simmons, I think, spoke about it. Um, Kareem Jackson, a couple other players have talked about how much of a leader that Christian Parker is, how good he is at explaining things to players to help them pick stuff up. So, yeah, I definitely – that's the way I would look, especially if you go with Dan Quinn as your head coach. Yeah, go get me an inexperienced guy who hasn't called, who hasn't been a defensive coordinator before, and let's see how it, he does it. Because if he's not working, then at least you can fall back on Dan Quinn a little bit. And that's kind of where I was going with that. Uh, I actually have Christian Parker as a name to watch, uh, not specifically for for Dan Quinn. Um, that's that's actually a really good idea. I didn't think about that. Well, one. Uh, to be fair, I'd only look at Christian Parker as DC with an experienced head coach that has a defensive coordinator background. Right, and that and that would eliminate it from the guy that actually put it underneath because Kellen Moore was the one that I was thinking. You know, keep some continuity with the defensive scheme and stuff like that. Let him kind of work with the players and and utilize the the connections that he does have with the secondary specifically, and see if he can't kind of you know boost his boost his resume more or less and boost his experience. Um, it might be some some growing pains, but if you have an offensive prowess like a, a guy like Kellen Moore who's been very creative with his scheme. Um, is help develop quarterbacks and stuff like that. Obviously with Dak Prescott, uh, I, I think that that would be a, a decent move. But uh, as far as Dan Quinn is concerned, that makes a, a hell of a lot more sense than pairing him with Kellen Moore, a guy who's a young, inexperienced head coach at the offensive uh, on the offensive side of the football. Pairing him with a young, inexperienced guy on the uh, defensive side of the football doesn't necessarily make sense, which actually kills pretty much my entire argument for the guys I have for Kellen Moore. And while we're at it, let's just get right into it. Uh, well, real quick, the, I just want to say is my my big opinion is if you're hiring or hiring a rookie head coach, mm -hmm. then don't hire a rookie coordinator for the opposite side of the ball. Right, like hire somebody with experience to take a little bit off their their plate at first, anyways. Um, and then Eddie James came in and asked, "What do you guys think of Byron Leftwich?" Man, I think that he should be a lot higher viewed than he is because people don't yeah. realize this is last year at the beginning of the season they were running a lot of Bruce Arian scheme. And things weren't working, and Tom Brady wasn't – I don't want to say he wasn't happy, but he was frustrated that things weren't working. So Bruce Arians basically handed the offense to Byron Leftwich, let him basically rebuild it with Tom Brady to what fits, and look at what that offense did. And they're continuing to use that yep. to, to this day. It's yep. main, It's largely a put-together Byron Leftwich offense with a lot of Bruce Arians' concepts in it just change and everything. And I absolutely love that aspect. It's not this question that we have with others – that the Broncos have interviews with, like Eric Bynamy and even Nathaniel Hackett, how much of it is the head coach and the quarterback? Like, there's enough there for that you can say, this is what Byron Leftwich has done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and excuse me there. Yeah, uh, th one of the big things was just being malleable, uh, being flexible, being uh, not so rig rigid in the scheme that you want to run, uh, reforming the the scheme that you have into the players that you have to help it fit them um, building your scheme around the players that are there um, he not only did Byron left which mold a little bit more of what uh, he wanted to do with what uh, Tom Brady wanted to do he also helped mold you know Chris Godwin into an elite number two wide receiver um, 
the Scotty Miller kid, that slot receiver that they had, they helped accentuate his talents. They had two tight ends in OJ Howard and Rob Gronkowski that were widely involved um, in multiple different facets. And I mean, obviously everyone knows that Mike Evans is one of the top receivers in the game, but I mean, seriously, what they were able to do with being able to push the ball down the field, which is not something that Brady has been great at over the the last stretch of you know, what five years or so before he went to Tampa Bay um, with also the timing routes and stuff, the deep over routes and, and everything that they were able to do in Tampa Bay last year. Left, which is should be a, a guy that's getting a lot more run than he is. And honestly, it only sounds like I think he had an interview in Miami and I know that he's got one in New York. If he hasn't already finished that one up, it would be surprised to me. But uh, I, I think that that might be where he's going. Um, also, some more intel with Dave Gettleman retiring. They're looking for a uh, a new uh, general manager, Benjamin Albright reported this on uh, Broncos country tonight that Adrian Wilson, I believe is his name. uh, The director of player personnel at the, at uh, Arizona Cardinals is a guy that is to be looked out for as the general manager for the uh, New York giants. And his preferred head coach is in fact, Byron Leftwich. So that would be the direction that I would think of. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Adrian Wilson was playing for the Arizona Cardinals under Bruce Arians while Byron Leftwich was part of that coaching staff. Yes, yes, he was. Yes, he was. Um, Peter Middleton jumping in. Any coach of the Broncos that you can see getting a promotion to another team? Uh, th- this is actually an interesting one. Uh, Eric, I wanted to do I wanted to do this last week, was kind of run through the Broncos' current coaching staff and see if there was some uh, any, any potential guys that could be retained, um, that could be on their way out. Uh, one that I really like a lot, and I hope that he stays with this new coaching staff, is uh, Zach Azani, the wide receivers coach. He's done great work with Cortland Sutton, helped out a lot with uh, uh, Emmanuel Sanders, Demarius Thomas at the later end of their careers. Um, look at what he's done with uh, – Jerry Judy's not necessarily one to give it a good example of, but Tim Patrick is a great example here. Um, he's also worked a lot with Noah Fant, from what I understand, as far as trying to help him develop his route running ability. Um, there's been a lot of high-quality work that Zach Azani has gotten out of. These younger, more inexperienced route runners, specifically Cortland Sutton and Tim Patrick, but uh, – there, there were rumors there for a while that he could be considered as a, a, an offensive assistant, like a passing game coordinator or something like that. And another position, maybe even an offensive coordinator somewhere. Um, Mike Munchak is a guy that I could see getting a, a, not necessarily a promotion to another team, but getting sniped off the Broncos at the offensive line position uh, coach position. And then Bill Kolar is a guy that, uh, it's it's surprising to me why he hasn't been tabbed as a, a potential defensive coordinator with what he's a, been able to do with the scrap heap defensive lineman that he's had building quality defensive linemen, not only in Houston, but also in Denver and multiple stops along the way as well. Um, Kolar's a guy that really could be, you know, a guy that gets a promotion moving forward as like a defensive coordinator somewhere. I really do believe that. Um, Yeah. I don't think that anybody on the Broncos staff is in line for a promotion elsewhere. Um, and I mean, passing game coordinator, running game coordinator, those aren't considered promotions to, um, just regular position coaches. So, uh, maybe Zach Kazani does get a passing game coordinator, but that's not technically a promotion. Um, well, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a lateral move in the site of the NFL. I, but I, guess, I, don't, I don't see anybody going for offense coordinator or defense coordinator. Okay, that's and that's fair. I, I guess that it was poorly worded by me. I was just thinking that the added responsibility of that, not yeah. only just being the wide receiver coach. I, so that to me is where I, I say the, the promotion of the passing yeah, I, coordinator. I, I mean, I, I get it. And the NFL is very bad with how they determine what's a promotion or not. Right. Because I think if you're a wide receivers coach and somebody's offering you wide receiver coach and passing game coordinator, then yeah, that should be a promotion. But the, in the eyes of the NFL, it is not. But then again, for the longest time, up until May 2020, going from a quarterback's coach to an offensive coordinator wasn't even a promotion for the NFL. Yeah, it's just, it's just strange. Uh, did you see the promotion that Tom McMahon's going to get? He's going to go from fire to potentially being the special teams coach in. Uh, no, he's Carolina. not fired. He's still under contract with the Broncos. Uh, it's it's so they, Ben Shermer. Uh, I I understand. How they they won't works. remain that way. Yes, but they yes. are until new coaches. Uh, technically, yes, you're not wrong, but also I'm right as well. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it, it's it's bad. The fact the fact that Tom McMahon is still a, potentially has a job in the NFL after the work that he has done in Denver in the last what four seasons has been. Oh my God, it's so mind boggling to me that uh, he could potentially still have a job in this league. But it's the Panthers. And like, I didn't mind the Matt Rule hiring, but he has quickly proven that to be like a mistake. Did you see his comments about Rashawn Slater? Yes, I did. Uh, that was. And I remember last year in our private chat, I kept telling Nick that there are people who feel that way. And Nick was talking about how dumb that is. Like, it's true, though, and I don't agree with the sentiment at all, but it just goes to show you 
that the size and the length matters so much to it. Yeah. Like it, for tackles, Rashawn Slater should have been viewed as a tackle, but some people didn't. Um, and then the, I think the worst part though was the comments about trading for Sam Darnold and then uh, immediately picking up the fifth year option. That was far worse than what he said about Rashawn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. You Matt, can see the regret in his face. Matt Rule is is probably going to be on his way out next year. I mean, he, he needs to win for sure. Oh, yeah, they've got a, they've got a right a, there. Right year for him. For, okay. like, if there's any coach that is entering it, based on his comments that's coming in, like Joe Judge was the guy, but he ended up getting fired. But like Matt Rule going into 2022 is uh, for sure um, on the hot seat. Just just starting the season, he's on the hot there's seat. There's one comment here that I want to get to. Kevin Durantula says, why fire of Andrew? You guys confirmed DC and fire Shermer. Shermer, because that just undermines the new head coach that you had the previous head coach still on the staff could lead to some power issues. And I mean, it's just not something that happens. Yeah. To, to, to take a, a head coach. Yeah. To, to take a head coach and, and bring like to demote him essentially. Like if you ever, you don't get demoted to stay with the same team. Right. Think about it in your, in your own job in your own personal lifestyle. Like these, it, it, I understand it's a business in, in the NFL and uh, there's a lot of crazy things that go on. People get promoted and, and fired for a lot of crazy reasons, but when have you ever had like a real job where you got demoted or had to take a pay cut and you were just okay with accepting that? Like the, the NFL is quite honestly, the only world where stuff like that actually happens where they come to you and say, we're going to slash $5 million off your salary. Graham Glasgow, you can earn 1 million off of it back by staying here and playing. But if you don't take this pay cut, you're looking for a new job and they're probably not going to pay you this much. Like, th like that's how this, this business works. You can't look at a guy that's been a head coach for the last three seasons. That's one of the most well-respected defensive minds in all of football. Like he's not going to be without a job longer than maybe Tuesday next week. Vic Fangio is going to get hired somewhere. You can't do that and say, you're now not the head coach anymore. You're only going to focus on the defense, which is what Vic Fangio only did which anyways, but you're not going to do that. And then have a, new, a fresh transition into new leadership and have it be like an okay situation behind the scenes there's gonna be like eric said there's gonna be a power struggle there's gonna be ego battles there's gonna be arguments and discontent behind the scenes that is gonna leak out and it's gonna turn into a toxic situation which is worse than what the broncos are currently like and i don't know it makes it even worse when you hear about vic Fangio and bradley chubb and shelby harris and justin simmons and a bunch of other people who started having issues with vic Fangio's coaching there's been there were multiple reports from Von Miller not liking the way Vic Fangio ran things, and those were accurate. They hated the fact that they didn't have Mondays off at the first couple of years; they had Tuesdays off. They hated that aspect, or the Tuesdays and Wednesdays, or whatever it was. They hated that. Shelby Harris. Everybody was shocked when Shelby Harris decided to resign for resign the first time for that one year deal, but nobody else wanted him after the Colts traded for DeForest Buckner, and John Elway was the only one to offer him some money. I mean, he had a huge issue with Vic Fangio, and it's obvious why. He didn't like the fact that he was playing nose tackle to start the season. Yep. Justin Simmons and Vic Fangio got into a yelling match on the sidelines this year against the Raiders. There were so many issues with multiple players. Bradley Chubb yelled and cursed and stormed off the field during practice at one point or something like that. Like, multiple issues with it. There's a reason why that they started playing for the position coaches and not Fangio, and they just didn't want him there. Like... Yep. Shelby Harris' defense of Vic Fangio is probably one of the most fraudulent things I've ever seen. Like, Vic Fangio I, was a good person, no doubt, but he had his issues as a coach that players didn't like. And it was that way in Chicago, too, and it was that way in San Francisco. He wasn't a coach that rubbed everybody the right way. No, and Shelby Harris had multiple issues with Vic Fangio. It's not just the one on the sideline. There, there was multiple issues in practice. Uh, I, I believe that there was somebody that said that uh, you don't need, you didn't even deserve to get hired at this position. I, I think that that was something I, I saw before. Like, it, quite honestly, Shelby Harris and Vic Fangio did not get along. Uh, anyways, uh, Nathan jumping in here. This is a new name for me. And uh, Eric, I'm not sure if you recognize Nathan Leitulala here um, with a generous super chat. And we thank you, Nathan, for joining us today. Uh, is there a potential coaching candidate you're hoping the Raiders don't get? Uh, yeah, Vic Fangio. I don't want Vic Fangio to go to Denver because I don't want to play Vic Fangio's defense two years or, or two times a year for the next four years. I, <laughs> sorry. Uh, as far as a head coaching candidate, um, I'm not sure. Uh, Brian Dable would be one that I wouldn't necessarily like to see go to, to Vegas. 
Um, I, I think I could deal with Hackett. Um, it would make it kind of a pain in the ass here, but I'm not sure exactly how it would it would work there. Josh Jacobs would kind of thrive in that running scheme. He would be another one that I don't want to see there. Um, but really, it's it's Jim Harbaugh and uh, um, Jim Harbaugh and uh, Vic Fangio are the ones. And oh, hey, I, I nailed the the pronunciation. Leituala, got it. I'm good. I, I you know do. who I don't want to see stay. Who who I don't want to be the coach of the Raiders next year. Rich Passaccia. Yeah. Yeah. Rich, Rich Passaccia. Rich that, Passaccia, yes. Yeah. He should be in the in the conversation for coach of the year. Like, quite honestly. He kept, that team, he, he kept that team fired up. Yes. After everything happened with John Gruden, he came in and just jumped all over Denver. He kept them fighting. They had their multiple rough games, no doubt about that. But that team never quit on him. And it's one of those things of that they never quit on him. They love playing for him. He, he's that leader. Like, he's one of those coaches that if you can – if you give him the head coaching job and he's able to get guys that he that he feels can help out this team around him, like that team could be something next year, like just with the way he is. So I kind of don't want them. I don't want I don't mind Harbaugh. I don't want it paired with Vic Fangio. Um, there has been some speculation about Vic Fangio going to Miami as well. Um, so we'll we'll see what happens there. But uh, the Raiders, I mean. They're in a weird spot. I mean, both games, that defense just trounced all over the Broncos offense, and that offense was effective when it normally it's the defense struggles and the offense is pretty is pretty good. But so if they can find a way, a coach to help them be more consistent, like they can be a pretty dangerous team. They really can. They've got a lot of talent. Um, they need some more help with the receiver position and obviously defensively, but um, even though it, and like you said, they don't like get to away from away cover from the, three. Yeah, they don't like to get away from the cover three, and they don't have the players to run that either. Um, Jonathan Abrams is so bad. They they want Jonathan Abrams to play the Cam Chancellor role like he did in uh, in Seattle, and it was just not good. But uh, uh, Nate Hobbs, that's a, that's a revelation of a player there, a guy that Eric and I think I, I think you and I made fun of the Raiders for drafting Nate Hobbs in what the fourth or fifth round or something. No, like it wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't mind the pick, and uh, Nate Hobbs isn't exactly a. Is an interesting one after his DUI and then playing this last weekend. That's very true, uh, but that, that like that's the dis the discontent and the, the disorganized. The whatever I don't even know the correct word to put here. That's not a curse word, but uh, uh, yeah, it's a uh, interesting to see. You know, Henry Ruggs. You've got the the Damon Arnett now. Nate Hobbs. Uh, obviously, the Gruden situation. Like Rich Basaccia did a great job with that Raiders team, and I, I hate to say that, but uh, if there's anybody that's deserving a coach of the year, Rich Basaccia is definitely that. Uh, Kevin jumping in here. This is another new name and we appreciate you for joining us here, Kevin. Uh, Hey, Eric, uh, thoughts on penning uh, Bernard Raymond. And also I love Muma as our second, second round pick. I'm not just saying that because of Lance, ha ha. Uh, Chad Muma, that's uh, Eric's boy. Eric's the one that actually pointed it out to me. I didn't follow Wyoming as much as I usually do this year. Um, didn't get the opportunity to, but uh, the penning kid is a uh, Trevor, I believe is his first name. And Trevor then Bernard Penning. Yep, uh, Trevor Penning and then Bernard Raymond out of Central Michigan, I believe, is the tackle that way. I have not watched either one of those guys, but Muma I like a lot. Eric, what do you think of uh, Trevor Penning and Bernard Raymond? I like Penning, and I currently am well aware that I sit a lot higher on him than many others. I'm very curious to see what he does at the Senior Bowl, and depending on what he does there, it might drop him a little bit for me, going against some tougher competition. And Bernard Raymond, I mean, he and his counterpart, can't, the first name's Luke. I can't think of the last name. Were probably the best tackle duo in college football this last year. I mean, they were both great. Um, and I honestly, if Denver landed one of them, like I'd be fine with it. I like both of them a lot. Yeah. Uh, Travis jumping in here. Uh, last one. We got to get into Kellen Moore really fast uh, as far as the offense coordinators and stuff like that. Uh, uh, Bill O'Brien said that if he gets a head coach job, he would tap Vic Fangio as his defensive coordinator. Um, B.O.B. Currently, Miami and I believe Jacksonville have tabs on Bob. Eric, am I wrong on that? Um, Jacksonville, yeah, they're ones that are big on Bill O'Brien. Yeah, and I think Miami was as well. I I can't remember if I I can't remember if that's right or not. Anyways, yes, uh, Fangio has his defensive coordinator. That's interesting. That Which, really is interesting. I find it hilarious that the defense of Bill O'Brien was that he was a good coach. No argument here. He wasn't a terrible coach. Right. When he got control of the personnel side of things is when things started to fall apart. And I think it was Ian Rapport who came out and said that um, he just wants to be a head coach, which he wasn't bad at, and he has no intentions of of wanting player personnel control at this time. 
And it's like, at this time, it's probably one of the most concerning series of words that you can say when involving Bill O'Brien. Yep, that's very, very, very true. Peter, one last one here. Uh, any of the head coach candidates that you'll hate or at least dislike to be the coach? Eric Bieniemy. And I know that that's going to go over like a lead balloon with a lot of Broncos country, especially with what the Kansas City Chiefs have been able to do offensively. But uh, Eric Bieniemy ain't bringing Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes with him. He's not, okay? Uh, he has not regularly called the plays. He has called the plays before, but not regularly called the plays. Um, he's uh, a bad interviewer from the sound of it. Eric, go ahead and take it away. I got to sneeze really bad. I, well, I'm... I mean, part of the concern with Eric Bieniemy is – Interviews. I mean, it was the same thing with the special teams corner, Dave Tube, that they don't interview well and they don't present a clear vision of how to make the team go forward. Um, supposedly, Andy Reid's been trying to work with them and improve that aspect so they can get coaching things or head coaching gigs. And I'm in agreement with Lance. I'm not a big fan of Eric Bieniemy, um, what he wants to what he wants to bring. And another one that I'm just not sold on is what Rich Gannon. That the the Eagles defensive coordinator, uh, Jonathan Gannon. Jonathan, Jonathan Gannon. Gannon. There we go. So many names. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm not a fan of that one as well. Um, Leaf came in and says, "Thanks for a great show, guys." I came in late, so maybe you discuss this. But who do you want to coach the Broncos? My top three options are, I mean, of guys that they have interviewed or that they have are planning on interviewing, is um, Nathaniel Hackett, Kellen Moore, Dan Quinn. I think are probably my top three. Um, I. Wouldn't mind O'Connell either. I think he's probably right there about four. Uh, so for me, it's Dan Quinn, um, Kellen Moore, and then uh, Brian Callahan. I, I I like Nathaniel Hackett a lot. I really do. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I like the quirkiness that he brings. I like the experience he brings. He's been to the NFC Championship game – or, excuse me, the AFC Championship game, carried Blake Bortles to get there. Um, I, I have questions, obviously – he had the one great year in Jacksonville, but then he was bad after that. Um, he was bad in, in Buffalo as well. And it kind of, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's fair to say he's got Aaron Rodgers. It's also unfair to say that Nathaniel Hackett isn't a part of that. However, um, the one that really intrigues me the most is uh, Brian Callahan. Based on what he's been able to do under Zach Taylor, who calls the plays, I will say that Zach Taylor calls the plays in Cincinnati, but with Joe Burrow and developing the scheme that they have currently with uh, the Cincinnati Bengals, um, I see a lot of similarities with the Broncos. The offensive line play in Cincinnati can definitely improve. However, they're using the offensive line the way that they should be. Joe Mixon is a great running back. They do a, a really good job of incorporating him in the pass game. And with the Broncos personnel lining up like parallelly with the uh, um, with the, the Bengals personnel, you have uh, T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd, and Jamar Chase in Cincinnati, and you have. Tim Patrick, Cortland Sutton, and Jerry Judy. The three wide receiver sets that they're able to use, um, utilizing C.J. Uzama, who's an athletic tight end that doesn't block the greatest, but they use him in the passing game, especially vertically on deep overs and over the middle of the field. That, to me, rings a great deal of respect for what Brian Callahan's able to do. He also has ties with the Denver organization. Um, you could bring his dad in as well to help be potentially an, another offensive line coach alongside Mike Munchak and then also have him be an, an assistant head coach as well. That's Bill Callahan, who was the, the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys for a long time, uh, very well respected in NFL circles as well. Um, to me, Brian Callahan is the third guy. It'd be Dan Quinn, Kellen Moore, and then Brian Callahan hand for me um let's see here a couple more here i think we're i think that's pretty much it i, I do want to get into uh some other potential offensive coordinator uh, coaches here uh obviously i just got done talking about brian callahan one that eric you brought up to us a couple of different times here on dove valley deep divers as well as in the uh, private chat uh he's the quarterback coach and i think the passing game coordinator in uh Kansas City right now. Mike Kafka, former NFL quarterback, played with the uh, Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, what do you think of Mike Kafka and his potential possibility of being an offensive coordinator in Denver? Specifically, I, mean, I, I, I do want to throw out the caveat, specifically under Kellen Moore here. I mean, it would be interesting. I mean, you're having a first-time head coach with a first-time offense coordinator that are coming from pretty different schemes. So I think there can be some, not necessarily butting of heads, but there can be some potential schematic issues there. Um, and then with Mike Kafka, you have to wonder how much of Patrick Mahomes' development and play, how much of that is him, how much of that is Andy Reid, and so on and right. so forth. I mean, the same concerns that you have Eric, with Eric Bieniemy. Right. I think Mike Kafka right, it needs to get out of that shadow so we can get these answers um, or get these questions answered. 
I would like to see him better paired with a a veteran head coach than a, a rookie head coach. But that, personally. That's, that, that's a fair point. Um, it, would it be a veteran head coach on the offensive side of the football then? Uh, kind of similarly with uh, what you would do with uh, like Dan Quinn saying, you want to bring in Jonathan Gannon, for example, or like a Gerard Mayo under Dan Quinn. You want to throw uh, – for like Doug Peterson with Mike Kafka, which that's a pairing that they've actually worked together, by the way, uh, Doug Peterson, and Mike Kafka worked together in Kansas city. Um, so uh, is that kind of what you're getting at there? Yeah. I mean, as I said earlier, it's like, I don't want to hire, I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of hiring rookie head coaches and then rookie coordinators beneath them more so on the opposite side of the ball. But with this one, it's more so the schematic differences potentially creating some issues there um, with Dan Quinn. He has experience. I wouldn't mind Mike Kafka as the offense coordinator in that situation, just as I wouldn't mind look uh, Luke Getze, the Green Bay Packers right. quarterback and passing game coordinator, because we have that head coach that has that experience. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so what about like, say the, the Broncos go in the direction of uh, Nathaniel Hackett and you've got uh, the, the Stanovich guy um, and then Luke Getze as potential offensive coordinators underneath him. Does a familiarity with the scheme that you're currently running, even though it's it's Matt LaFleur's scheme and Nathaniel Hackett's kind of just coordinating everything behind the scenes, you still have the, the run game coordinator and the pass game coordinator. If you could potentially get a Nathaniel Hackett and then bring along an Adam Stanovich or a uh, – a Luke Getze, is that something that intrigues you as well? Or are you looking for some uh, something different as far as an offensive coordinator is concerned? Like something that uh, brings a, a newer perspective to get away from the familiarity and uh, we're going to do things this way only kind of uh, kind of thinking. I mean, I wouldn't mind that. I mean, they're coming from the same system, the same scheme. They have, they've worked together. So it's a little, it's quite a bit different from, you know, Kellen Moore and Mike Kafka pairing. I wouldn't mind that. And I think that, if you get Nathaniel Hackett, I think Luke Getze is the guy to go get at offense coordinator. I don't think that Adam Stenovich would be be the option there. I think that he's kind of in line to take over as the offensive coordinator there in Green Bay mm -hmm. because they have a assistant offensive line coach that they really want to keep around. Um, and giving those promotions, I mean, might potentially enable them to keep that offensive line coach because maybe Nathaniel Hackett doesn't want to keep Mike Munchak around. They want to go get this Green Bay like. There, there's a lot to the whole premise that in the NFL, it's not about what you do. It's about who, you know, there's a lot actually to that. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind those pairings. I think that they would have a good working relationship. And I, I, for me anyways, part of what showed it that they seem to have, at least from the outside, that they have a good working relationship was Nathaniel Hackett interview yesterday about um, when he found out Luke Getzey was also getting a yeah coaching yeah. interview for the Broncos. I think that showed that there is a close connection between the two of them. Yeah. And uh, something else that I had heard the other day was that, uh, um, and Dan Quinn and Kellen Moore, when, uh, when, uh, Kellen Moore was starting to get tabbed around as far as uh, head coaching candidates, he went to Dan Quinn, a guy that's obviously had that head coaching experience and said, Hey, what can you do to help me? And Dan Quinn kind of took him under his arm and said, Hey, I'll show you how to, you know, prepare yourself for these interviews, what you need to have, um, like how to present yourself in the, in the correct way. So I do believe that both of those, those guys, um, obviously Getsy as well. Uh, and Nathaniel Hackett, who's been in multiple different interview rooms as well. Uh, I think that guys that are, have been, you know, uh, privy to that process more than just once, uh, and specifically to the head coaching position and handing those those uh, anecdotal experiences down to these younger guys is it, it speaks a lot to the younger guys that could potentially be coming up in this league. Kellen Moore specifically that he went he was smart enough to go and reach out to Dan Quinn and that Dan Quinn was willing and able to take him under his wing and help guide him through this process as well. I mean, uh, it's it's a pretty exciting time for those guys, but uh with that, guys, I'm not necessarily feeling too hot right now. I've got some – I'm not sure if it's allergies or anything. I'm starting to stuff up really bad. So and we're going to have to get out of here for tonight. Thank you all for joining us on the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. You guys can find me on Twitter by uh, following me at SandersonMHH. For Eric, at Eric Trickle. Also for Scott Kennedy, who's running the ones and twos behind the scenes, at Scout Kennedy. Um, guys, while you're at it, follow at Mile High Huddle. That's the uh, mother account where you guys are going to find breaking news and analysis regarding your Denver Broncos, including film breakdowns and opinion articles, um, the draft content. We're getting ready to start rolling out some premium draft content uh, out there as well. Uh, make sure you guys are following at Mile High Huddle for all of that. Facebook supporters, go to facebook.com slash Mile High Huddle. Click that blue Become a Supporter button where you're going to get to trickle
vertical zone. Um, we get Kellerman's corner uh, as well as Broncos book club with Chad Jensen every single week. Eric, are you, is there any updates on trickle zone coming up here soon? Not at this time. No. Okay. Sounds good. Um, but uh, let's see here. One last thing while I can grab it. Uh, uh, where's it at? Uh, huddleuppod.com guys that's it uh, huddleuppod.com make sure you guys go uh, up that way that's the merch tent where you guys can get a dove valley deep divers hat or a t-shirt um there's a hoodie a face mask a uh a, a onesie for your baby a coffee cup anything to suit your fancy huddleuppod.com that's the merch booth again guys if you're financially able to do so head on over that way and uh get some swag we, we would appreciate that uh and if you guys aren't financially able to do so, three things you all should be doing by now is subscribe wherever you guys are watching this on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, um, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, wherever you guys get your podcast content, subscribe to Mile High Huddle. Uh, two, like every single video you guys see specifically on YouTube. It helps us out a lot. And the third thing, if you love it, share it. Share it out in front of as many Broncos fans as humanly possible because that is the most organic and easiest way to help us do what we do best, which is cover your Denver Broncos. So. Uh, I've got Scott is jumping in here. He wants to throw up Peter Middleton jumping back in one more time. Man, Peter, you are you're the bomb, dude. And we appreciate you every single week. Uh, are there any connections with our coaches and the candidates? Um, the, the coaches and candidates we were talking about or the coaches and candidates that are potentially connected to like George I think Payton? he's asking the current coaches that we have and the coaching head coaching candidates. I don't know on that one. I'm not sure. There possibly could be. I'm actually not sure on that. I, I do know that a lot of the I, I, I do know that a lot of the list that George Payton put out as far as the the head coaching candidates that could be potentially linked to the Broncos and obviously the guys that they're interviewing do have ties with George Payton at previous stops. Um, obviously, Dan Quinn is a guy that uh, uh, wanted to work with George Payton in Atlanta a long time ago. Um, there was Jonathan Gannon who worked with jo- George Payton in Minnesota. Um, there, there was a handful of other ones. I know Eric Bieniemy spent some time in, in Minnesota as well. Uh, there's some guys that had some ties with uh, George Payton back in his Miami Dolphins days. Um, they, like there, there is definitely it is a connections game. It's not uh, not ne- it, there's a lot of uh, who do you know and how long have you known them? Uh, what is your relationship with them more so than what can you actually bring to a franchise? Uh, a lot of nepotism that goes on in the NFL, and unfortunately for uh, a lot of teams that can get uh, a lot of quality coaches. It can get uh, um, it can get ugly and it can turn into a, a failed opportunity or a missed opportunity for teams to actually improve their organization. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think Gary Kubiak is one prime example of that yep. it was always about him wanting to bring in his own guys. Yep. And when um, Rick Dennison. Rick was Dennison the, was a guy that always came what, with Gary Kubiak. When they hired Rick Vangio, they were talk, wanting to bring Gary Kubiak back as offensive coordinator, right? Yep. Was it yep. here? But what ended up happening there was that Rick Dennison wanted to be in, and John Hoy flat out said no. I mean, he yep. wasn't the only one. There was other coaches that he wanted to bring back, and it was just no. Like, Rick Dennison wasn't a good coach, and Gary Kubiak always stuck, um, tied their ships together. And so not always the best idea. It worked out for Denver once, but I mean, sometimes it's, it doesn't always work. Yeah. All right. I'm going to run through this chat one more time. We got some quick last minute questions here. Uh, any good returners in this draft from Todd? There's another question about that. I haven't really Eric. focused on anybody's returning ability. Um, the Utah kid, I can't remember his name. Um, and uh, he had a, I, I believe is a kick return touchdown in the Rose bowl against uh, Ohio the- state. 50 year old kid from Utah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, Scott jumping in here. It, the 25 year old kid at Utah. Yep. Um, <laughs> it, the Mormon mission potentially is, is a part there. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's pretty much it guys. Um, I'm going to get out of here and go get some medicine down and try to get this stuff taken care of. But uh, thank you all for bearing through it with me. And thank you all for joining us on the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. You all stay safe and take care. Have a great rest of your weekend. Uh, go 49ers. By the way, go 49ers. We want this interview with Dan Quinn to happen as soon as humanly possible. Uh, But, uh, again, you all stay safe. Take care. Have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you guys next. Go ahead, Eric. And any of you who are able to turn into Broncos Country tonight here in about half an hour, I'll be here with Ryan Edwards and Benjamin Albright. 
Yep. Uh, 735, 735 Mountain Time. Uh, go to iHeartRadio. If you guys are not in the Denver area, go to iHeartRadio. Uh, go to the 850 KOA page. They play it live on, on the app. Uh, Eric's going to be joining Ryan and Ben talking about uh, the, the head coaching search with those guys on Broncos Country tonight here at 735 Mountain Time. So anyways, with and, that, guys. And KB, get to feeling better, man. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's KB. All right, guys, we'll see you guys same time, same place next week. Uh, And as always, go Broncos. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.